Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Gay is not sin, and Jesus is not asking the gay person to change and be straight. That's right. The Bible doesn't condemn gays. People, we live in an exciting times. Jesus is about to return, and we're hearing news every day that's really strange that we should be able to think about. Are we really in those things that we hear talked about the last days? Yes, we are, because Jesus is going to come soon. Not, necess not necessarily as soon as you think, because there's still lots of stuff that needs to be done. And there's got to be the two witnesses that got to begin to appear uh, doing their ministry. And Antichrist has got to be somehow showing up. Uh, uh, maybe we have somebody that's doing that now uh, that we hear about every single day. And, and so many people strangely still support that person. Who knows? But there's all kinds of things that is really strange. And the strangest things that we should ever be considered is what the church is doing. Because, for instance, this last election we had a, somebody that was voted in to become president that has a history and it talked about pre pretty much daily for the past year or more about sexual immorality, uh, infidelity, and so forth of a president. Now, before this last election, as a rule, Christians would not stand for it. If their pastor had any kind of uh, infidelity with his wife or extracurricular activities sexually, um, he would be oosted from uh, being pastor of that church. There's been plenty of pastors that lost their job because of hanky-panky. And the church, of course, you, uh, as this program comes on and, and try to explain that gay is not sin. The church, of course, has been condemning gays upside down and backwards. And one of the biggest things that they've had for so long was that gays weren't married. So they're, uh, of course, living in fornication. Of course, now gays can get married. So that, that argument doesn't exist anymore. But the church has been adamant against gays trying to say it's a sexual immoral act. And... Over the years, it's, the church has took a high stand on sexuality as though that's the sin that's going to keep you out of heaven. And it doesn't matter any other sin. <clears throat> Take low priority. Uh, so, at least when you listen to sermons and everything, when they're talking about we're sinners, the only thing it seemed like they want to give us description is sexual immorality. And yet, here now we're living in a time where 80% of evangelical Christians support a president that has so much in his background of sexual immorality, and yet they still support him. This should be a big sign to the church. Of course, if the church is supporting evil, as it were, then how are they going to ever be able to recognize signs of the end when part of the signs of the end is as much as two-thirds of the church is going to support Antichrist and give him that final authority. The rest of the world will pretty much have given him authority to be dictator of the world, but it's the church that has to come through and get that final authority because, the, and they have a big reason, because the two witnesses are going to be out shaking the church uh, to get them ready for the rapture. And this will take three and a half years during the first half of the tribulation. When you hear people preaching on pre-trib, they're telling you a false doctrine is created by a woman named Margaret in 1830 when she had a vision at night. And so she said that God told her that there's a pre-trib uh, rapture. And then about 10 years later in 1840, Darby enhanced this vision to make it a church-wide doctrine, basically. So today you're believing 
a pre-trib rapture is based on just a few flimsy verses that indeed tells you that there's a rapture, but it doesn't tell you a time. When there are verses that give you a better uh, indication of it, it says you'll know the hour in, in Revelation 3.3 3, if you only uh, watch. But if you're not going to watch, you won't know the hour. In Revelations 11, verse 18, it tells you that Jesus has given rewards to the saints. A lot of people want to say the saints aren't around as of around Revelations 3 or 4. But almost a whole uh, book of Revelations talking about saints and, and uh, shaking going to be going on. And finally, as the sixth trumpet is finally finished and the seventh trumpet is going to be blown then the, then Jesus gives his reward to the saints and the mystery of God is revealed which is explained the chapter before and at this same trumpet the seventh trumpet the last trump and uh, even one of the verses that is used by uh, pre-tribbers says that at the last trump and they're not necessarily talking about the president, but <clears throat> the last trump begins the seven bowls of wrath of God, which is the last three and a half years of the tribulation. In Revelation 11, it talks about the two witnesses uh, quite a bit, and uh, <clears throat> they're going to be bringing all manner of plagues on the world and to the church as well because the church needs to be shaken and getting ready for they have so many false doctrines which most Christians readily admit to of past his Christianity uh, how they controlled and, and abused and killed uh, Christians and ruled them with a strong arm arm and the Protestants did about the same when, after the referendum when Martin Luther nailed his 95-point thesis on the Catholic Church door, which has mostly, you know, that gave us where if you just believe in Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. And you don't need to have a church organization deciding things for you in your relationship with God, that you personally can have a relationship with Jesus. And this all is the result of Martin Luther. But he also started becoming extremely strict as years went by. And the Protestants pretty much adopted lots of the similar things that the Catholics were doing in persecuting innocent people if they don't follow the ideals of the church wide organization and this hasn't changed much through the centuries and millennia today we're having the same kind of thing like I said earlier 80 percent of evangelical Christians wanted Trump to be president based on this kind of mysterious policy that he's going to change things and they just turn their cheek their their head away from any immorality or lies that he does and says, no, nope, for the sake of, he's going to clean it up. He, there's even a prop, uh, somebody having a vision saying that God told them that he chose Trump. Well, of course, God always chooses the leaders of countries and for his purpose. It, it doesn't mean he chose a wonderful, God-fearing Christian to be a leader. He, he chooses people as who is he will. And and this one person, again, uh, that had this vision, who was on Sid Roth, It's Supernatural, was saying that uh, God chose Trump to be, to clean up the United States. Well, this is possible. God can choose evil dictators to uh, pretty much wipe out some of the things that was causing some problems and the United States definitely does need cleaning of a lot of corruption and everything and and 
God can choose anybody he wants. And Trump was the person that he's going to choose, just like he chose Hitler to have uh, the World War II type of thing, to another stage of bringing us to the point where the whole world would be able to be in a one world government type of setup ruled by an antichrist. It has to be an antichrist and it has to be a uh, one world government in this tribulation period. There was 490 years uh, set for punishment for God's people and 483 of them were fulfilled when the exodus happened and the Israelites that were held in as slaves in Egypt were delivered by Moses and so 483 years was completed at that time and that that 483 years is broken up into a couple other periods of time of 30 years or something 34 years something like that that added up to 483 years then there's a huge gap that the last seven years of that 490 years has not been fulfilled yet and so the 70th week of Daniel, they call it, the Bible calls it, is that one week, which is seven years, uh, that will fulfill that 490 years. And it's for shaking the church. So there's, God sends his two witnesses to shake the church, to uh, get them ready for the rapture. Now the rapture, as I said, happened in Revelation 11, verse 18. 1260 days uh, of the ministry of the two witnesses where they'll be able to bring plagues at their own will to whomever they want. They can just call down plagues anytime they want for any reason. And this is one of the reasons the church begins to hate them so much that they're looking for a way to get them killed. And Antichrist is saying that he can guarantee he can kill them because he wants them dead too. And so the church, uh, finally, that's when they finally says, yes, we'll go ahead and approve you. We'll give you our stamp of approval. And sure enough, he can kill them. Antichrist has 1,290 days, and that can't start from the beginning of the trib. When he signs the peace treaty, it has to start from the end of the trip when he has power as ruler of the world. And you go 1290 days from the, when Jesus steps on the Mount of Olive up to towards the beginning of the trip. And, and you come up to the last 30 days of the two witnesses. So it takes him 30 days to kill the two witnesses. And then, of course, we read they... The whole world is giving gifts and they're happy and celebrating almost like Christmas <clears throat> that they died and then they get to see him raise. Finally, a good part of these two-thirds of Christians see the light and realize that the two witnesses had a message and they uh, see that it's everything is fitting together That and they come to terms with their walk in Christ because one of the biggest disobediences of the church is loving your neighbor as yourself and we have in Leviticus uh, 28 26 or 26 28 at the fourth level of disobedience by the church and there's three levels before that in that chapter and every time that the church doesn't repent and begin to obey God they uh, go out and continue their disobedience, which is basically hating your neighbor and not loving them. And we've had times in the past where the church did this kind of thing, uh, joining together to repent of their sins. And what they do, they go out from there and they cut, they come down harder on all the people that don't have their same ideals in their doctrines or anybody that like gays or other people they just condemn the whole batch of them harder than they ever did before and so they basically 
disobeyed God, so God has to bring seven times the the plagues and stuff than before. And the final one that we're in now, the types of seven times the previous one can only be <coughs> fulfilled in something like the tribulation period. And during this <coughs> tribulation period, we'll see half the world population killed by either natural disasters or by wars. And People will be rounded up if they don't agree with the government program and millions will be killed, executed. And they already got systems set up for this, including guillotines. Heads will roll, literally, as the Bible says, uh, <clears throat> when you come up and they say you got to accept Antichrist and receive the mark and you say, no, you won't then your head is going to row or you'll be killed in some other ma manner. <clears throat> and, and these things are pretty much set up. Uh, we're pretty much set up so that we can go into a uh, tribulation type period. And it just recently on TV, China was showing, there was a documentary uh, about China in their camera system that they got. They got more cameras in public than <clears throat> any other country. And each camera can have multiple facial recognitions. When you see the whole crowd of people, these little boxes <clears throat> surround everybody's face and even hands. And these technology when the, you look at the monitor, it'll show very things that show what kind of clothes they're wearing if they're male, female, and several other characteristics about it, they can recognize you. And often they use it to, they, they have a picture of a criminal and they put it into the database and then it, it finds them out on the street someplace because this system is live and it, it, it goes out and is checking the whole population uh, in these video cams they have everywhere and I think they said something like 3,000 of these were people were caught that way in recent times and so this system is very operational and uh, a lot of the United States kind of doesn't want it because we're kind of like our privacy rights although we're giving them away year by year and companies like the idea that China has these cameras because they can hook them up in their retail stores and, and places and they can determine what product that a person may want by what they're doing. Of course, you know, you probably don't want to be a shoplifter in those days because it's also looking at your hands and can know immediately if you're taking something or not and then they can, it can flag it and report it. Uh, that's kind of interesting if you ever get a chance to look at that kind of technology that is operational and China is applying it to their whole country. So it's uh, something that can be done to hundreds of millions of population and there of course we know is over a billion. And so these webcams you see all over the place can be pretty sophisticated with this facial recognition technology we have. And so they can easily put any, any kind of data what they're looking for about you. And so we're getting closer and closer to this time where we can begin to see things affect in our life. Uh, so far we've been going through a lot of time and years that when we wake up in the morning and get up and eat our breakfast or something, go to work and get to work and work and come home and we don't really notice anything different unless we turn on the TV and hear uh, the same kind of news over and over and over again 
uh, it used to be kind of nice to watch the news like CNN or something and, and you get to see the news of the world now there is no news all it is is a uh, uh, a biography on Trump's daily life <coughs> I guess that's important but there are other things happening in the world and there are a few stations you can watch to to hear about some of the other kinds of things going on in the world. Uh, but, you know, we're getting close to the time that Jesus returns. And uh, so you can you look out, you know, and see the signs of the times. You can see trees begin to blossom, like this cherry tree behind me. Um, so it looks like I'm going to have a lot of cherries this year. Uh, but the most important thing is to get ready, and that is to know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. A lot of people like to preach, accept Jesus Christ so you miss the tribulation and you miss any of the pains that goes, goes on. But that's not going to happen, people. Your Christians are going to experience at least half of the tribulation, and the other half of the tribulation isn't just for unbelievers. It's still to try to round up the last bit of stubborn people that God has selected, basically, to live forever in heaven. And some people are going to be pretty hard to convince. And we'll need that last half of the tribulation to finalize their, their eternal relationship. And... But the, so, but accepting Jesus is not simply missing all of this. Yes, when, when you accept Jesus, if you die and you believe that He's the Son of God, then you, when you, when the the dead rise first, you would be guaranteed to rise. But if you're alive <coughs> and the rapture takes place, you have a choice all the way up to the moment of the rapture to turn your back on Jesus or to continue believing in him and it's simple to believe in him in fact right now you can do that believing in Jesus is Jesus asking you to get engaged to get married to him and because God so loved you that he sent Jesus to pay the price for your sin because if you paid the price for your own sins you would die eternally but Jesus and God so loved you that Jesus sacrificed his life on the cross and shed his blood, which was worthy, to pay the price for your sin. So you don't have to pay the price for your own sin. So if you just believe that God sent Jesus to die on the cross for your sins and you ask Jesus, forgive you of your sins and come into my life, then Jesus will forgive you your sins and pay the price for your sins and then you will be what's called born again and then if you die or you endure to the end you will live eternally with Jesus Christ and remember this is an engagement to Jesus when he comes back then you'll get married to Jesus and but then to get to know Jesus you need to read the Word of God the Bible read the whole Bible and the New Testament is tells you about Jesus coming the Old Testament does the same thing but it also gives you kind of a history lesson of what all took place so you know the whole story and this is very important this is how you get to know Jesus for he is the word and he baptized you in the Holy Spirit so Ask Jesus to baptize the Holy Spirit. This will give you and do you with power to endure to the end. And there's gifts of the Spirit too. One of them is healing. And you could be healed today. You got a place of pain? Go ahead. Let's, let's, Jesus will heal you. Put your hand on that place of pain right now. In the name of Jesus, be healed. Now tune in every week at the same time you're watching for. I come on the same time. And please go to my website and click on the donate button or the GoFundMe button 
give a little, give a lot. I, I need help as anybody else would in ministering on TV. Thanks so much. See you next time.